Let's go ahead and pray again. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord, we're on a journey here from original man. We just finished talking about historical man and a lot of the different struggles that he goes through and is going through. And now as we begin to talk about eschatological man, our destiny in heaven, I pray that the hope of heaven would possess everybody's heart. As we listen to this together, as we talk about this together, I ask you, Spirit of God, Spirit of resurrection, to flow into our hearts and to help us. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. <clears throat> All right, so we have covered point number one, Christ appeals to the beginning, and we looked at God's original plan for man and God's plan for love. And then through that lens, we went into point number two, Christ appeals to the heart, where we began to talk about different wounds of the heart. And now we're going to look at number three, Christ appeals to the resurrection. So we've gone from original man before the fall, historical man from the fall to the end of time, and now we will look at eschatological man and our destiny and God's ultimate plan for us in heaven <clears throat> and how that has something to do also with our human love and sexuality. So first, let me just define what is eschatological man. <clears throat> it is that final stage of our perfection achieved in the resurrection at the end of time where we will be freed from any tensions between the flesh and the spirit within ourselves. We will be perfectly united with God and with one another in the communion of the saints. So when does Christ appeal to the resurrection? <clears throat> I'm going to look at Matthew chapter 22. And we'll read from verse 23. In verse 23, it says this, the same, so this is Matthew 22, verse 23, The same day Sadducees came to him, who say that there is no resurrection. And they asked him a question, saying, Teacher, Moses said, if a man dies, having no children, his brother must marry the widow and raise up children for his brother. Now there were seven brothers among us, the first married and died, and having no children left, his wife, left his wife to his brother. So too, the second and the third, down to the seventh. <clears throat> and after them all, the woman died. In the resurrection, therefore, to which of the seven will she be wife? For they all had her. Verse 29, but Jesus answered them, You are wrong, because you, neither, you know neither the scriptures nor the power of God. And here is where Christ appeals to the resurrection. For in the resurrection, they, speaking of male and female, <clears throat> they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. And as for the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what was said to you by God? I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. He is not God of the dead, but of the living. And when the crowd heard it, they were astonished at his teaching. Two essential elements in what Jesus stated here in these verses. Number one is this. He stated that there will be a future resurrection. A future resurrection of the body. He said in verse 30, For in the resurrection they, speaking of male and female. Number two, <clears throat> he describes the state of the bodies of risen human beings. Verse 30 says, They Neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. Luke chapter 20 and verse 36 in the same, same account, from Luke's perspective, it says this, They cannot die anymore, because they are equal to angels, and are sons of God, being sons of the resurrection. So what is the resurrection of the body? The resurrection of the body is the joining at the end of time, of the bodies of the saved with their souls in heaven, at which point they will participate fully, bodily, in a face-to-face -face encounter with God, 
within the marriage of Christ and the church. So this doctrine of the resurrection of the body has been challenged throughout all of church history. I want to read a couple passages from the Catechism in regards to this, starting in paragraph 996. The church says this, From the beginning, Christian faith in the resurrection has met with incomprehension and opposition. On no point does the Christian faith encounter more opposition than on the resurrection of the body. It is very commonly accepted that the life of the human person continues in a spiritual fashion after death. But how can we believe that this body, so clearly mortal, could rise to everlasting life? Paragraph 1015 says this, The flesh, or the body, the flesh is the hinge of salvation. We believe in God who is creator of the flesh, the body. We believe in the Word made flesh, Jesus, in order to redeem the flesh. We believe in the resurrection of the flesh, the fulfillment of both the creation and the redemption of the flesh. Paragraph 1017 says, we believe in the true resurrection of this flesh that we now possess. We saw, we sow a corruptible body in the tomb, but he raises up an incorruptible body, a spiritual body. St. Paul says in 2 Corinthians, knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus into God's presence. So we will enjoy heaven with our bodies. So what will heaven be like? Revelation says this, God himself will be with us. He will wipe away every tear from our eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. So in heaven we will experience the fullness of Christ's redemption. Our heart, our soul, our desires, and our body will be redeemed and glorified. They'll no longer will have this feeling of being torn between sin and God. We'll be completely free from this inner tension. Heaven is perfect union with God. The church calls heaven the heavenly marriage. In Revelation chapter 19, the Bible says this. This is in heaven. This is describing heaven. And the 24 elders, sorry, this is Revelation 19, 4 through 9. And the 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshipped God, who is seated on the throne, saying, Amen, Hallelujah. And from the throne came a voice crying, Praise our God, all you his servants, you who fear him, small and great. Then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the sound of many waters. And like the sound of mighty thunder peals crying, Hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory. Listen carefully now. For the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. It was granted her to be clothed with fine linen, bright and pure, for the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. And the angel said to me, Write this. Listen to this carefully. Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are true words of God. So Jesus did not come only to forgive us and to save us and to change us. He ultimately came to unite us with himself and become one with us. And this brings us back to what we talked about in one of our first sessions the spousal meaning of the body. See, the marital meaning of the body is when I give of myself sincerely and totally to another, and they reciprocate that love towards me. So remember that theology of the body is the study of God as revealed through our bodies. The one flesh union of a married, of a married male and female points toward a participation in a heavenly marriage. 
It is an icon, it's an image, a foreshadowing of eternal union with the Trinity. Eschatological man will be married, but not to another human as on earth. Jesus said this in Matthew 22, In the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. So our heavenly marriage will exist in the sense that we are all members of or one with the body of Christ. So what was Jesus saying to the Sadducees out of the passage that we just read? Jesus was not saying that marriage does not exist in heaven, but that in the resurrection, the earthly sign of marriage as the union of a man and woman will give way to the reality to which it was pointing us to. It will be a single reality that we will all participate in together. The marriage of Christ and the church. The Catechism has some beautiful language about this. In paragraph 1045, I want to read that to you. Paragraph 1045, this is speaking about the hope of the new heaven and the new earth. I want you to pay attention to the marital language as I read this. For man, this consummation will be the final realization of the unity of the human race, which God willed from creation and of which the pilgrim church has been in the nature of sacrament. Those who are united with Christ will form the community of the redeemed, the holy city of God, Listen to this, the bride, the wife of the lamb. She will not be wounded any longer by sin, stains, self-love that destroy or wound the earthly community. The beatific vision in which God opens himself in an inexhaustible way to the elect will be the ever flowing wellspring of happiness, peace and mutual communion. So let me say this, everyone on earth is called to marriage, the heavenly marriage. Okay, Anthony, but what about those male and females that are called to a celibate, consecrated life, a priest or a a consecrated virgin? So when a priest is ordained, who has he married? He's married the church, the bride of of Christ. When a woman enters consecrated life, she has espoused herself to Christ himself. So the celibate vocation is our earthly reminder that heaven will be an eternal wedding celebration between God and his bride, the church. Married couples are a sacramental sign that points to this eternal reality, this heavenly marriage. The earthly sign of marriage is fulfilled in heaven where there's total union with God. So when a person chooses to, cel- cho- chooses to be celibate for the kingdom, for the sake of the kingdom, listen carefully, he or she is skipping the sacramental sign of the heavenly marriage, which is matrimony between a male and a female, and in a very real way, living in the here and now, the eternal reality to which marriage points to, undivided union with God. So celibacy is a free choice to renounce marital communion with a spouse in order to serve God and the church more fully. And it's a free choice. It's something that Christ invites them to and that they say yes or no to. Okay, wait. Then does celibacy reject sexuality? No. See, those who respond to God's call to consecrated life show us the ultimate meaning of sexuality, giving ourselves completely to God. And they embrace their sexuality, and then they channel that energy toward full communion with God. Okay, then how how do celibates fulfill the meaning of their bodies? They totally consecrate all of themselves to fatherhood or to motherhood 
by serving God and humanity. And as a result, <clears throat> they give life to many spiritual children by their union with Christ and the church. Okay, then wait. Isn't celibacy kind of a form of repression, sexual repression? Maybe you're a, a person who's prepping to be married, or you're married and you're, you're thinking, I can't even imagine not having sex. Well, first of all, if this is your thinking, then your understanding of marriage and sex is disordered. Because marital love is not an outlet for lust or sexual tension. Both the married and the consecrated are called to holiness, to dominion over desires. But wait, wait, celibacy seems so abnormal. Only in terms of it not being the norm in society. But it's not weird or wrong. If God truly calls a person to a celibate life, he will provide the grace to live that out. Holy, joyful celibates uniquely conform their lives to that of Christ. Okay, I think, what about this? Why, why is the priesthood reserved only to men? So I'm not going to talk about the fact that Jesus appointed 12 men in the scriptures. I want to talk about it from a little bit of a different perspective, but that is also true. But why is the priesthood reserved only to men? Well, it's not because of sexist discrimination. So I have a question for you. Why do only women have the God-given ability to give birth? What if I were to say that's not fair? So in the natural and supernatural order, there are unchangeable realities. So priests stand in what the church would call persona Christi capitis, in the person of Christ. The church is the bride of Christ. So you see here that Christ is referred to in masculine terms and the church in feminine ter terms. God created marriage to be a union between a man and a woman. Only a man can act in the person of Christ as groom meant to marry his bride, the church. So there is an ontological problem. Ontological means that in one's very own essence. There's, there's an ontological problem with a woman standing in the person of Christ because Christ was and is a man. You cannot have a female standing as Christ, a male, saying the Mass, saying in Christ, this is my body given for you, at which the consummation of the marriage between Christ and the church takes place. So as much as a man cannot be a mother, a woman cannot be a father. And the priesthood is a spiritual fatherhood. So celibacy is really an eschatological sign. What do I mean by that? Celibacy for the kingdom foreshadows something of what heaven will be like. In heaven, we will belong totally to God. Celibate people are living testaments right now to selflessness in this heavenly type of love. Their sacrifice directs their sexual energy to God alone. And their virginity offers them a glimpse of the ecstasy awaiting us in heaven. Ecstasy, now this, I need to be clear about this, ecstasy that comes from total divine union with God is far above a mere human union. Which leads us to the union of Christ and the church and asking this question, will there be sex in heaven? Well, let me answer it this way. No and yes. Let me explain. Will there be sex in heaven? No. There will not be conjugal relations as we experience here on earth. Not because sex is bad or unworthy of the kingdom. Remember, God created sexual intimacy, and it is therefore good. I want to remind you, though, what is the purpose of sex? Number one is to bring about new life. Number two, to bring about unity between husband and wife. And number three, it is a foreshadowing of the union that the redeemed will have with God in heaven. And in heaven, the unity that sexual relationships bring us here on earth will not be needed. 
Why? Because we will have arrived at the consummation of all perfection, the beatific vision. Let me illustrate this for you. Say you're going to take a road trip from New York all the way down to Florida. As you begin to drive, you're going to see signs. Florida, 1,000 miles. You're going to drive a little bit more. Florida, 500 miles. Florida, 10 miles. Florida, 5 miles. Then eventually you will arrive at Florida and you will not need those signs anymore. So signs point us to the reality that we will soon experience. And once we arrive, we don't need any more signs because we're there. And once we are in heaven, there will be no need for sexual relations to foreshadow divine union because we will be experiencing divine union. In heaven, we will reach our purpose, our fulfillment, and our completion in Christ. So there will be no need for additional human beings. Bringing forth new life will be unnecessary because we have entered into life himself. So masculinity and femininity are eternal, but sexual intercourse on earth is merely a shadow of the greatness of the eternal exchange of life in love with God in heaven. So let me ask this question and answer it a different way. Will there be sex in heaven? Yes. So although no physical sexual relations will exist, there will still be the difference between the sexes. Do you remember what the gender was in Genesis? We read, male and female, he created them. As in Genesis, we read in the book of Revelation, chapter 12, about a perfect male and a perfect female in the eternal Eden called heaven. It says this, And a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of twelve stars. And then it says this, She was with child, a male child. So will there be sex? Will there be gender in heaven? Yes, male and female. God's plan is for you and me to partake of this heavenly kingdom with him. A place like Eden, where God will dwell with us unhindered by our sin. God's will is for you and for me to partake of this fruitful river of the water of life that flows from the throne of God and of the Lamb. Heaven is the ultimate end and fulfillment of your deepest longings. The state of supreme, definitive happiness. Heaven is to be with Christ. Heaven is to see God's face. Jesus makes all things new. Night shall be no more. Male and female, God created them. Male and female, they fell into sin. Male and female, God redeemed them. Male and female. This is eschatological man, our destiny, your destiny. And this gives us hope today. John Paul II coined this phrase, the, the hope of every day. What is this hope of every day? He said, John Paul II said this, the hope of victory over sin. What was the result of original sin? Do you remember? Human nature became weakened in its powers, subject to ignorance, subject to suffering, subject to the domination of death, and was inclined to sin. So as we wait for the redemption of our bodies, as it says in Romans chapter 8, we are in a constant battle between sin and obedience. But the hope of every day, according to John Paul II, is this, that the battle is ours to win in Christ. We can live in freedom and defeat evil with good. Christ offers us grace to begin anew now. Galatians 5.1 says this, For freedom Christ has set us free. Why did he set us free? For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand fast, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. So no matter our past, there is still hope and freedom to start over. Why? Because the word 
became flesh. The Word became a body and dwelt among us, full of grace and truth. And we have beheld His glory, glory as of the only begotten Son from the Father. Mother Teresa said this, Love, to be real, must cost, it must hurt, it must empty us of self. And this is how Jesus loved you. God has unveiled his plan for true love. His name is Jesus. So what should I do today? The Apostle Paul invites you to do this in Romans chapter 12. I appeal to you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual act of worship. And in closing, I want to challenge you to do this, to be this. Be a prisoner of hope. Romans chapter 8 says this, We know that the whole creation has been groaning with labor pains together until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait for adoption as sons, the redemption of of our bodies. And then the Apostle Paul says this, for in this hope we were saved. So I just want to remind you that God loves you so much that he sent his only begotten son to live for you, to die for you, and to rise for you. And is calling you to give your life to Christ to die in him and to rise in him and to walk in newness of life and ultimately to be redeemed and to live with him forever. Answer the invitation and I urge you to say yes because God has a good plan for you. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Lord, I thank you for this theology of the body. Thank you, Jesus Christ, for appealing to the beginning and showing us how it was meant to be. Thank you, Jesus, for appealing to our hearts, even when it hurts, and giving us the grace to respond to you and to unite ourselves with the cross so that we can say yes to you, appealing to us about coming to heaven and being redeemed forever. Today we say yes to you, Lord. I pray for every single person that is watching this that they would open their hearts to you and that they would experience your healing power and anybody who is struggling right now, Lord, that you would show up right there wherever they are and minister healing and minister life to them and draw them to yourself. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, Amen.